Bonjour à tous, c'est avec un grand plaisir que je vais vous présenter M. William Gabriel Rioux, qui est le premier étudiant qui a été sélectionné à l'issue d'un concours qui a été lancé par le laboratoire pour avoir des présentations étudiantes. M. Rioux est bachelier en droit de l'Université de Montréal ainsi qu'en éducation de l'Université McGill. Il a entrepris des études supérieures en droit des affaires sous la direction de la professeure Julie Biron, qui est ici présente aujourd'hui, et il va poursuivre son cursus académique en tant que boursier à l'Université de Toronto dès septembre prochain, aussi en droit des affaires. Monsieur Rio a eu quelques opportunités d'enseignement dans les universités de Western Ontario et euh, également à l'Université Concordia. Et il est également un diplômé des conservatoires de musique de Québec et de Paris, où il a étudié le piano et le violoncelle. Donc, je lui cède la parole. Merci, Monsieur Rio. pour la belle présentation. Ça me fait vraiment plaisir d'être avec vous euh, ce matin pour aborder le thème de l'action collective en valeur euh, mobilière qui fut le sujet de mon mémoire euh, de maîtrise. Comme c'est un sujet qui est à la fois vaste et euh, très pointu, on va se concentrer ce matin seulement sur euh, deux points euh, principaux. En fait, on va débuter euh, avec euh, les critères d'autorisation, critères d'autorisation qu'on va retrouver dans le Code des procédures et dans la loi sur les valeurs mobilières. On va enchaîner par la suite avec l'arrêt de principe qui est l'arrêt Terra Technologies qui a été rendu par la Cour <coughs> suprême du Canada en avril 2015. Donc, avant d'entrer dans le vif du sujet, euh, j'aimerais mettre la table avec vous afin euh, de vous expliquer un peu en quoi consiste euh, le recours statutaire de la loi sur les valeurs mobilières. Comme vous le savez sans doute, les marchés euh, financiers constituent une relation entre vendeurs et acheteurs. Pour bien comprendre la mécanique euh, de ces marchés-là, on va les diviser en deux catégories, marché primaire et marché secondaire. Les marchés primaires vont constituer euh, le lieu de rencontre entre les metteurs et les investisseurs. On va alors parler euh, de prix d'émission. Vous pouvez voir euh, d'ailleurs sur le petit graphique. Pour les marchés secondaires, quant à eux, on va euh, retrouver le lieu de rencontre entre les investisseurs qui sont désireux euh, de vendre et les investisseurs qui sont désireux d'acheter. On va alors parler de prix de marché. Aujourd'hui, on va se concentrer sur les marchés secondaires. Et pour pouvoir intenter un recours en vertu de la LVM sur les marchés secondaires, on va devoir être en présence de l'une des quatre causes d'action suivantes. Grosso modo, ça va être là qu'on va avoir euh, un, le représentant, l'émetteur, son représentant ou encore une personne influente qui va faire une déclaration fausse ou trompeuse par le biais de la publication d'un document ou par une déclaration verbale publique. C'est nos quatre causes d'action qu'on retrouve ici. Donc, c'est lorsqu'on est en présence de l'une de ces situations problématiques-là que le recours sur les marchés secondaires va être possible. Un élément euh, important euh, du euh, recours statutaire sur les marchés secondaires, c'était l'ajout euh, de la présomption de l'article 225.12 de la loi sur les valeurs mobilières qui, euh, lors des amendements de 2017 de, 2007 de la LVM, est venu alléger le fardeau du requérant. Dans la mesure où euh, le requérant n'avait plus euh, à faire la preuve lorsqu'il intentait le recours, qu'il s'était fié au document euh, ou à la déclaration publique qui contenait des informations fausses ou trompeuses lorsqu'il a acquis ou lorsqu'il a cédé ses titres. Donc, en plus d'alléger le fardeau euh, du requérant, l'ajout de cette présomption-là est venu euh, ouvrir la porte aux actions collectives qui, jusque-là, étaient pratiquement impossibles euh, pour les requérants parce qu'ils devraient prouver, l'ensemble des requérants devait prouver qu'ils s'étaient fiés aux documents euh, qu'on a l'information fausse ou trompeuse lorsqu'ils ont acheté ou lorsqu'ils ont cédé leur titre. Donc, vraiment, cette présomption-là a été l'ouverture au recours aux, aux actions collectives. Pardon, on a encore de la difficulté à, avec le nouveau terme. Donc, on arrive dans le vif du sujet qui est l'autorisation. Pour que le recours sur les marchés secondaires soit autorisé, on a deux critères qui doivent être respectés. Donc, le premier critère, l'action doit être intentée de bonne foi. Il doit y avoir une possibilité raisonnable que le demandeur ait gain de cause. 
Ces deux critères-là ont suscité pendant plusieurs années beaucoup de questionnements euh, de la part des tribunaux quant à leur interprétation. D'ailleurs, je vais y revenir un petit peu plus tard lorsque je vais aborder l'arrêt euh, Terra Technologies. Mais ce qui est important de comprendre pour l'instant, c'est que la jurisprudence a établi que les critères de la LVM sont plus exigeants que la simple apparence de droit. Euh, que la simple apparence de droit qu'on retrouve aux articles 574-575 du CPC pour autoriser l'action collective. Toutefois, les, les critères de la LBM ne sont pas aussi exigeants que euh, le, le critère de la prépondérance de la preuve. Donc, à ce point-ci, ce qu'il faut comprendre, c'est qu que lorsqu'on est en présence d'une action collective en matière de valeur immobilière, nos deux critères, critères du Code de procédure et critères de la LBM, vont se chevaucher à l'étape de l'autorisation du recours. Comme je l'ai déjà mentionné, les critères de la LBM étant plus exigeants seront davantage difficiles à surmonter pour le requérant. Dernier point euh, dans euh, les explications du recours, le recouvrement. L'objectif principal de la LBM est un objectif de dissuasion. On peut très bien s'en rendre compte en euh, regardant euh, l'article 225.33 qui vient limiter le montant des dommages que le requérant pourrait réclamer. L'impact majeur de cette limitation-là est que, euh, on a remarqué qu'au cours des dernières années, en fait, les requérants ont eu tendance à intenter un recours à la fois en vertu de la LBM et à la fois en vertu du droit commun pour obtenir un dédommagement qui est supérieur à ce qu'on leur offre euh, justement dans la, dans la LBM. Donc, c'est vraiment un objectif dissuasif que la loi sur les valeurs mobilières propose. J'enchaîne avec l'arrêt Terra-Technologie. Maintenant, vous êtes un peu plus en, à l'aise avec le recours sur les marchés secondaires de la LBM. Terra-Technologie, c'est une société pharmaceutique montréalaise qui est inscrite à la TSX, la Bourse de Toronto, qui, en 2009, a lancé un nouveau médicament, la Tessa Moréline, qui euh, avait pour objectif d'améliorer euh, la vie des patients atteints du VIH. <coughs> Donc, dans les mois suivants, Terra a fait une demande d'approbation auprès de la FDA et un processus administratif s'en est suivi. Au cours de ce processus administratif-là, la FDA a publié sur son site web le mémoire rédigé par Terra Technologies pour, euh, en vue de l'approbation du, euh, du médicament. Donc, Terra, Terra Technologies avait préparé un document et la FDA l'avait publié sur son site par la suite. Ce mémoire-là, qui a été publié le 25 mai 2010, mentionnait que le médicament produit par Terra engendrait des risques élevés, voire même vraiment importants, de diabète chez les futurs, chez les futurs patients. Donc, suite à la publication du mémoire, le cours du titre de Terra s'est littéralement effondré et a perdu 58 de sa valeur. Les, princi les, les principaux actionnaires justement, ont décidé de liquider une partie, voire même la totalité de leurs actions. Et ce qui est ironique, c'est que deux jours plus tard, le 27 mai 2010, euh, la tessamoréine, le fameux médicament, a été approuvé par la FDA, ce qui a fait en sorte que le cours du, le cours du titre, deux jours plus tard, a remonté euh, et a repris 92 de sa valeur le 27 mai 2010. Donc, les requérants qui ont liquidé leur titre, euh, ils ont intenté une action collective en invoquant le régime de la responsabilité secondaire de la LBM, qui avait pour fondement la non-divulgation des effets secondaires qui se sont retrouvés dans le mémoire qui a été euh, publié sur le site Internet le 25 mai 2010. La Cour supérieure a autorisé le recours en 2012. Le recours a ensuite été confirmé par la Cour d'appel en 2013 pour finalement être rejeté par la Cour suprême euh, en avril 2015. La Cour suprême en est à la conclusion que les requérants euh, ne satisfaisaient pas les critères d'autorisation de la LBM. En fait, la Cour suprême est donc venue rehausser, mais surtout clarifier et confirmer l'interprétation à donner aux critères qu'on retrouve dans la LBM, qui sont, rappelons-le, plus exigeants que les critères que l'on retrouve euh, dans le Code de procédure. C'est vraiment une chance, une chance raisonnable de réussite. On ne parle pas seulement de, euh, de cause d'action viable ou défendable. Donc, on peut voir ici, là, justement, l'extrait de, euh, de la décision. Critère plus exigeant que le critère général d'autorisation qu'on retrouve, comme je vous ai mentionné tout à l'heure, dans le cas de procédure. La décision Terra, Terra Technologies a eu une influence majeure auprès des provinces canadiennes qui ont mis en application l'interprétation davantage rigoureuse et exigeante qui a été donnée par la Cour suprême. 
Cette interprétation-là a notamment été mise en application euh, par les tribunaux ontariens et par euh, la Cour euh, suprême dans la trilogie de décembre 2015, euh, Green, Célestina et Imax. Ces décisions subséquentes-là euh, ont d'ailleurs mentionné que la preuve avait un impact davantage important euh, au stade de l'autorisation d'une action collective en valeur mobilière, puisque euh, les critères, euh, justement la rigueur et l'exigence que la LVM impose viennent de montrer à quel point la preuve va être importante à cette, à cette étape-là. Pour conclure, pour conclure, la technologie a servi en quelque sorte de leçon euh, afin de démontrer que les recours opportunistes euh, n'avaient plus leur place et on est vraiment venu, euh, on est venu, on est vraiment venu répondre aux questions euh, qui se sont posées pendant plusieurs années concernant les critères qui se doivent aujourd'hui d'être davantage exigeants et rigoureux. Donc, merci pour votre attention. Et je vous Great pleasure today to present our next speaker. Uh, Mr. Rux is a recent graduate from NYU School of Law. He also holds a master's in philosophy with merit from Darwin University in England. And he's a triple major in economics, philosophy, and political science from Baylor University in Texas. He's been a clerk and judicial intern in multiple courts. And he will be doing a clerkship uh, this coming fall with the Chief Judge Stewart from the Fifth Court of Appeal in Louisiana. And um, finally, he's been a research assistant for different professors and associated to Texan firms. Um, we are happy to have him with us today. And uh, he'll be entertaining us um, on tax law and its implications in class action. So please welcome him. I'm going to be talking about a relatively narrow issue, although it's embedded within a more common problem in aggregate litigation. Uh, the larger problem arises when a large number of claimants press claims against a limited pool of assets. So a large number of claims against a smaller limited fund. Uh, Mr. Renault called this the fixed common fund. In the US, we solved the situation through a 23B1B mandatory class action. <clears throat> This wraps all potential claimants into a single class with no right to opt out. Then the dispute is adjudicated and the limited fund is paid out in an equitable manner. One understudied problem with the 23B1B class action is determining who should be in charge of valuing the limited fund. Valuing the limited fund is not always an easy task, especially with complex corporate arrangements involving international parents and subsidiaries. So again, the complex question is who determines the value of the limited fund and whether it is less than the outstanding claims. In Ortiz versus Fire Report, the United States Supreme Court said that this valuation duty falls on district courts. I believe that this makes little functional sense, especially when we compare it to other areas of law. Um, Briefly, I'll go over Ortiz versus Fiber Board and then move on to a few cases that have extended Ortiz versus Fiber Board and then look quickly at some other areas of law that undermine these, these other cases. Ortiz versus Fiber Board, for some of you may know, was a massive class action involving thousands of asbestos exposed plaintiffs suing for a limited fund composed of insurance funds, Fiber Board assets, and then some Fiber Board funds of roughly $500,000. Before reaching the Supreme Court, the lower courts had approved a mandatory settlement agreement that was designed to broker a global peace for all fiber board claims. Uh, virtually all future, present, and potential claimants were forced into this single proceeding, uh, which was just a complex payment scheme that distributed the limited fund in a supposedly equitable manner. Uh, when it got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court reversed and unwound the class certification for two primary reasons. First, there was conflicted counsel. They couldn't be trusted to adequately represent the class. There were future and present claimants within the class, which in US law is a big no-no, given that the two groups have pretty conflicting uh, interests in the litigation. Uh, a second uh, kind of subpart with the conflicted counsel was that uh, there was an excluded, they excluded a, a vast number of claimants, so uh, it almost ran directly against the idea of a mandatory class action that it excluded a certain number of claimants. 
Um, but the second big reason that the court unwound the certification is because the court below did not independently verify the value of the limited fund. It had simply accepted the party's assertion that the limited fund was X amount. And then also the assertion that X amount was less than the outstanding claims, which would have justified the mandatory treatment of all the outstanding claims. Instead, the court said the district court should have required evidentiary showings, it should have heard challenges from third parties, and it should have made its own independent factual evaluation findings. It should not accept parties' independent valuations of limited funds. Uh, and I'll just refer to that requirement as the independent valuation requirement of the court. Uh, after Ortiz, lower courts have taken this requirement and pushed it a little bit farther. Uh, and they push it into cases where there wasn't the kind of conflicts we saw in Ortiz where class counsel could not be trusted to adequately represent class members. Um, for example, in the In Re Simon 2 litigation in the Second Circuit, um, Judge Jack Weinstein, the district court level, had certified a class based on a limited punishment rationale. Um, these limited punishment class actions are based on the idea that there is a constitutional cap on punitive damages, and that is supposed to provide the limit for the limited fund. So if you can certify class just based on this constitutional cap, you can certify 23B1B class, wrap all the claimants in, and then equitably distribute the punitive damages. Uh, but the Second Court, the second, uh, second Circuit Court of Appeals disagreed and unwound the class certification based largely on Ortiz-style reasoning, just said, that because the fund, the theoretical cap, couldn't be accurately valued, the class had to be unwound based on OTs. Um, there are other class actions that have been unwound as well, where there was perfectly valid claims and adequate class counsel. Um, there are class actions against corporations with foreign subsidiaries and parents, where the district court did not adequately analyze piercing the veil laws to see if they could potentially wrap in some of these foreign parents and subsidiaries uh, and get some more funds out of them, which is complex analysis that wraps in lots of different areas of law, even international law. Um, but they still, courts of appeals have found this as an adequate reason to unwind these class certifications. Uh, and as always, we've already made clear that these cases differ from Ortiz because they involve motivated class counsel who have zealously advocated for clients and who have reached compromise and valuable payout for their clients. Uh, they're just not conflicted in the same way. Uh, it, in my contention is that these cases have taken the independent valuation uh, requirement a little bit too far. Um, where adversarial bargaining leads to a settlement, courts can't add a whole lot to the equation by getting involved in the valuation process. It's just simply outside of their expertise uh, and the, the transactions costs are, are enormous. Um, and so to kind of illustrate uh, another area of law where we take seriously adversarial bargains, I'm going to look to a really juicy area of law, uh, tax law. I'm sure all of you love tax law. Uh, but I'm going to look at, uh, at two kind of different areas in tax law. One, it's pretty narrow, and then more broadly at the tax system generally. Uh, I'm going to keep this relatively brief. Um, uh, but both of these areas demonstrate courts deferring to party valuations of contested legal rights. Um, the first, the narrow area, involves transfers related to marriage, so prenuptial agreements um, and then divorce agreements. Uh, in these situations, most of the cases within the U.S. law involve a wife transferring her marital rights, so her right to sue for half of her husband's wealth um, for stock. Um, and so the hard question in these cases, cases is, uh, what did the wife pay for the stock? Um, technically, what she paid is what she gave up, which are her marital rights. Something that are very, very hard to value in the abstract. Um, and so courts, when addressing these kinds of situations, uh, have, have taken pretty much the opposite approach to Ortiz. They've looked to see, are these parties bargaining adversarially, and if so, then they accept the wife's valuation of her legal rights. And the way that they accept her valuation of her legal rights is that they look to the stock that was, she exchanged her rights for, they determine the fair market value of the stock, and they attribute that as the value of her marital rights. Basically, they say that she has taken her rights, exchanged them for something of equal value, which sets the value of her rights and determines what she paid for the stock. 
It just accepts an adversarial part. Um, and even looking more broadly at the PAC system as a whole, courts don't question every bargain that we make or second guess our valuations of everyday exchanges. If you buy a candy bar for a dollar, the government is not going to come in and say, well, we think that wasn't worth a dollar, we think it was worth two, therefore we're going to tax that extra incremental gain. It's, it's just immediate deferral to, to these kinds of everyday bargains. Um, and so both, I think, of these situa both of these situations are relevant to assessing the independent valuation requirement or T's. Um, and uh, I think that in the case law, two primary reasons jump out. Uh, is why courts are deferring in these kinds of situations to adversarial parties. Um, first, parties just know comparatively more than the courts. They know uh, how to value these kinds of items, and they have way more information than the courts. This is especially true whenever we get into extremely complex, uh, complex mass torts and things like that. Uh, courts just don't have expertise in valuing these kinds of assets. Uh, and in the tax law, courts are very, very worried about producing inaccurate outcomes. Uh, and the second main reason is just the simple transactions cost story. Uh, it takes a lot of time, effort, and money to get courts up to speed, and the amount that you gain by getting a court involved and having adversarial presentation of evidence is relatively small. So the bang good for your buck is just, it's just not, not great. Uh, so in some what tax law has to say about the independent valuation requirement and when it should come into play is uh, first, courts should look to process. Courts need to make sure that parties are bargaining adversarially in the 23B1B context. They need to make sure that they're bargaining at arm's length and that they're using a process that uh, ensures that competitive outcomes are produced. Uh, if you look at Ortiz, it was the exact opposite. There was class counsel, they could not be trusted, it potentially looked like collusion. Or, or some kind of self-dealing, and this party simply could not be trusted, which gave you a reason to not defer to their independent evaluation. Um, if you look at the other cases that I mentioned in Ray Simon 2, or some of the cases involving foreign subsidiaries, then you have class counsel that can be trusted, and when you involve courts in that kind of valuation, that's when you really see the potential for wasted time, wasted money, and actually inaccurate outcomes. Um, Tax law would further say only if the process fails do courts get involved with the substance of deals and the substance of bargains. Um, I, I chose to look at tax law, but there are other areas of law you could look to as well. In bankruptcy, courts do the same thing. They look to settlement agreements, they look to process. If the process breaks down, only then do they get into, into the substance of the deals. And there are explicit quotes from bankruptcy courts saying, we can't adequately assess the value of these funds. It's too hard. Uh, and these are the exact same kinds of funds that are at stake <laughs> in mass courts cases. You can even look at uh, corporate law in Delaware, where courts are very, very attuned to process. Uh, anytime there is a self-conflicted transaction, uh, or self-interested transaction, or conflicted transaction, sorry, uh, courts will just look to the process. They'll set up procedures that they require the bargaining parties to follow. And if those break down, only then do courts get involved in the substance. Uh, in contradistinction to these other areas of law, we have the United States Supreme Court and Ortiz versus Fireboard, Fireboard taking the virtually opposite tack, placing district courts immediately into the substance of agreements without any look to the process first. Uh, and I think that uh, Ortiz can be read in a way that places process before the substance, before the independent valuation requirement, but lower courts of appeals, unfortunately, have not been reading uh, Ortiz that way. Uh, but that is the, the substance of my paper, so thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jordan Slavkoff, and I'm a student here at the Université de Montréal. Our next speaker will be discussing the importance of using and mitigating class-wide punitive damages. He is a graduate with the Bachelor of Arts from the University of Chicago, and as recently as yesterday, graduated with a JD from NYU. So, congratulations. In addition, he has already established himself as a young leader in the legal community, he is the co-founder and president of the Four Freedoms Democratic Club in the 76th Assembly District in New York State, and in the near future, we'll be working on the U.S. Court of Appeals 11th Circuit. 
Um, it is a great honor and privilege to present our next speaker from NYU, Gabriel Panik. Merci beaucoup à tous et toutes, uh, et merci uh, particulièrement à, à Professeur Pichet et la, la, la laboratoire ici uh, pour m'inviter. Um, so I'm going to do what everybody else has done and do that kind of French and then do the rest. <laughs> um, but I do want to begin with a quote um, in French. Uh, it's by President uh, Nicolas Sarkozy, and it this quote is sort of encapsulates what I'm going to be talking about for the next few minutes. Um, and he says about the relationship between class actions and punitive damages, S'agissant des actions de groupe, j'y suis favorable sur le principe. Je ne suis pas favorable à l'importation dans notre droit interne de principes tels que les dommages punitifs. Um, so that, those sort of statements didn't really make much sense to me because in my mind and in, in what I talk about in my paper, um, the relationship between class actions and punitive damages uh, seems pretty clear. And it's, I'm, I'm glad that I went right after the last panel, uh, which talked about the deterrence rationale. For, um, for class actions, because that's exactly at the heart of the relationship between these two, um, two regimes. And so, um, first, question of uh, just sort of uh, demonstrative quotes. Why class actions? Well, there are a number of rationales for class actions. We've talked about them today, but, but the one that I focused on is the idea of deterrence, that we have these types of claims, these negative value claims, these sort of diffuse social harms, um, that would risk under deterring um, and under capturing without the class mechanism. Um, but then you look at punitive damages, which um, are on top of the compensation to the plaintiffs. And the rationale for that uh, serves to compensate society for the major, major civil injuries to society at large. Um, and thereby affecting a measure of deterrence. Now, the fun thing about both of these quotes is that they come from the same opinion um, by the same judge. Uh, judge Weinstein in his Simon II opinion, talking about, um, in a case that's been discussed today already by a number of presenters, uh, a, a class action that was certified and then decertified by the Second Circuit, but not for these reasons. For these reasons um, that, that Judge Weinstein caught on to and that a number of professors have talked about since, and a number of courts, um, the, the rationale undergirding both class actions and punitive damages um, seems pretty similar. And so in my paper, I focus primarily on deterrence, but I also want to talk about um, access to justice as well, uh, because I believe both punitive damages and class actions help induce litigation in, uh, in a helpful way. Um, to quote Professor Zakharov, they uh, reduce the transaction costs of, of um, bringing these cases into court and class actions, being able to aggregate um, is, seems, you know, it's very simple that we need to be able to aggregate these claims together and the only way to do so um, is by pulling them in this aggregate litigation mechanism. But the same, um, the same doctrinal underpinnings also serve uh, to, to be true in punitive damages as well, that if, if we do not have the full measure of harm to society before the court, um, that plaintiffs uh, might not be able to bring suit because the money wouldn't seem, seem adequate um, for the lawyers to be able to file these cases. And so by adding on this additional level of damages that takes into consideration not just the harm to the plaintiffs, but the harm to society, what Kathy Sharkey calls um, societal uh, damages, um, in a very influential article from 2003, that the court is able to affect the full measure of, of harm to society and therefore affect the right amount. We were talking about the, what's the right amount of deterrence. This is the way in many class actions to affect the right amount of deterrence. Um, and I want to talk about uh, a case. It's not a class action, um, but it illustrates how courts in the United States have been thinking about punitive damages recently. This is a bankruptcy case from just two months ago. Um, <coughs> And the opinion starts, it's great, Franz Kafka lives, this automatic stay violation case reveals that he works at Bank of America. Um, and and the, 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 what this case was about was that there was mortgage modifications and 
the bank was a really bad actor and, and there was an automatic stay and they foreclosed on the house and they evicted the plaintiffs, so the plaintiffs brought suit. But I think that this case illustrates a lot of the reasons why we need punitive damages and also how we can respond to the concerns of people such as President Sarkozy. Um, and the, 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 the response, the, the, I think the aversion um, really is sort of an emotional one. This the idea that plaintiffs should not be overcompensated for um, bringing these claims, that if you have, a, you have a negative value or a very low value claim, you shouldn't come out with a windfall. Um, and that's true, but there are ways of mitigating that. And so what I talk about in my paper is this idea of these split recovery schemes, um, which gets at, I think, the main emotional objection. And that is where the court, either by statute or of the court's own volition, will say, look at the right amount of money to affect the societal deterrence, but it doesn't have to go to the plaintiffs. That's true, we don't want to unjustly enrich these plaintiffs, but we can give it to other types of bodies. Um, this is follows on from the C. Prey discussion earlier, except of course, the, there the money is already in the pot. Here we're adding money to the pot in order to affect this measure of deterrence. Um, and so, so, in this, so in this case, the judge says, you know, recognizing the under deterrence possibilities that, um, if we just had the right, the normal amount of compensation, which in this case was $1 million, that's a lot of money, but um, it's nothing to Bank of America. And so the court instead imposed, imposed $45 million in punitive damages and distributed it to these various centers, to the National Consumer Law Center, the Bankruptcy Rights Center, and a lot of law schools. Um, that's a lot of money for a law school, I think. I can hire some more professors with that. Um, and oh yeah, some to the plaintiffs as well, and the attorneys get to recover from this as well. And so, so this again, this wasn't a class action, but these kinds of schemes, these innovative um, types of schemes, this was judge made. Some of them, some states in the United States have these have mandates for this as well. But it shows how we can impose these um, these punitive damages in in. Um, it impose these punitive damages in cases without running into the problems that objectors have. And so by doing so, in the class context, when um, the harms are more diffuse, where the risk to society is much greater than in an individual case, uh, it seemed to me um, pretty clear that we would want to, that especially as new jurisdictions, new countries are experimenting with class actions, that instead of running away, from schemes like this that would allow a full measure of deterrence to be taken into account by the court, that they would want to embrace it and work to make sure that it doesn't run into the moral objections that might accompany it as well. Uh, and that's all.